It appeared on the earth before humanity did. During centuries it killed, but also cured us. It is mighty, it is always beside us. It accompanies us from the very birth until the death. It causes aversion, but it is incredibly beautiful. We confront it all the time and everywhere in everyday life. We don't notice it or we simply remove it. But what do we actually know about it? A fungus is um, an organism which is defined as an organism which actually excretes um, uh, enzymes into its surroundings, degrades the, the food it's going to eat, dissolves it away, yeah, and then absorbs those nutrients, sugars, carbo um, lipids, fats, back into the uh, organism. It's, it has what we call an absorptive form of nutrition. Um, most fungi are actually molds. Um, they're actually made up of very small pipe-like structures, uh, microscopic pipe-like structures or hyphae, yep, and they aggregate together into what we call a mycelium, and that's what's the, the mold that you actually see, a furry mass um, of, um, um, of pipe-like structures. And these pipe-like structures actually grow through the decaying organic material, push their way through as they grow. Sometimes fungi form visible structures, for example mushrooms. All the mushroom is, is the visible sexual reproduction part of a huge mycelium structure underneath it. There are a class of um, fungal pathogens that, that cause diseases in, in humans. Uh, they're, they're usually classified by how penetrating they are. So you have very superficial uh, infections just on the skin and then you have cutaneous infections which are actually within the skin and then deeper into the lungs and sometimes to the liver and the circulation. It's in infinitely variable. It'll need to be a threshold level, but that threshold will vary depending on the, uh, the build of a person, um, how um, ill they may be. The young and the old are particularly prone to fungal infections. Uh, people uh, with HIV AIDS are particularly prone. Um, people on chemotherapy. Uh, the, the, there are risk groups. Um, diabetics are particularly prone to fungal infection as well. So um, it'll depend on the person. It'll depend how big they are, how fit they are. At any time, it, your immune system will fight off a lot of infection. But if your immune system is compromised in any way, then you will be more prone to a fungal infection. Very difficult to give a precise number of how many spores per cubic litre or something that you, you would need to inhale say, to become infected. The mold spores are all around us, really, in this room now. Um, you'd find them, if you open the window, they'd come in the window. Probably your clothes, and especially the soles of your shoes, would be carrying spores in from the surroundings. So mold spores are here, but that doesn't mean they're going to grow. We are all trying to protect our house from the outside impact. Big locks, double glazed windows, we are making the flat more comfortable for us from the inside, but at the same time we are making perfect conditions for fungi to develop itself. In a house, for example, yes, you'd get moulds growing, as I'm sure you're aware, on your walls, uh, on newspapers, sometimes on clothes, but only where you've got uh, humid or moist conditions, say in a bathroom or um, where they've got condensation on the walls um, or in the bedroom, actually, because when one's asleep, one produces lots of water as one's breathing during the night, and that's conducive to mould growth. So as long as there are moist conditions and there are, there's material from, for them to grow on, usually starch in a wallpaper or paints and things like that, then they'll grow. You've got to stop the humidity. You can use anti-mould paint, fungicides and things, but that's only a temporary measure. You've got to stop the humidity. Get some good ventilation um, or uh, a dehumidifier or something like that. During the production of this documentary, we went to the laboratory to experiment and grow different types of fungi. The results of the experiments have shown again how fast fungi can reproduce, reproducing in only a week in a good environment. Within the lungs, for instance, uh, there's a particular uh, pathogen called Pneumocystis carinii, 
which, which can in, infect the lungs. There's a particular dangerous one um, called Aspergillus flavum, which is associated with um, uh, cereals and nuts that have been stored badly in a, in a very um, damp environment, and they can produce a, an Aspergillus flavum toxin, or for short, aflatoxin, and that, that's a potent carcinogen, so you can end up with uh, cancer of the liver as a consequence of Aspergillus flavum. Uh, aspergillosis is the, is the disease associated with it. Yeah, it, they can easily be treated usually, but they're usually not that severe. People just find them irritating. You're not going to die usually of a fungal infection. Yeah, it's just irritating uh, or maybe disfiguring or something like that. Uh, and so often people don't, they hope it's going to get better. But yes, if you went and got treatment, then yes, it should, you should be able to cure these things quite easily. Microfungi are located everywhere. On food, we remove affected areas and continue to eat the rest without knowing how harmful it might be. That's a little dangerous. Just because you can't see uh, a fungal growth on a piece of food doesn't mean that there, there isn't fungus there that, and, and that once you've inhaled or ingested it, it can reproduce within, within your body and, and cause a full-blown infection. We associate mouldy food with food that has, tends to have gone bad um, because it's been around for some time, it's got maybe moist, the mould's taken advantage. There's often a lot of other organisms probably growing there, especially bacteria, for example, producing nasty toxins. So mouldy food indicates that the food is probably, if you've had it a long while, it's probably not worth eating. Thankfully, as well as harmful fungus, there are also harmless ones. We are all sometimes enjoying Gorgonzola, Rockfort or Stilton. Cornwall has, uh, has now got the... Um, it, it's one of the best cheese in the world, isn't it? It's Cornish Blue. Blue cheese with, with, with uh, um, fungal blue veins in it, and, and then Stilton. There's some some of the most magnificent cheeses in the world that have, have a lot of mold growing in them, that, um, and that they are better for it. I would say, uh, you know, a lot of fungi are edible. Many people eat molds, don't they? Uh... You eat uh, mouldy cheese, for example, a lot of cheese, so blue cheeses and things like that, I'll actually have mould injected into them to make them taste a lot better. So um, a mould is just like any other organism, essentially. It's, it's full of nice fats, carbohydrates, proteins um, that you want to eat. So in a sense, there's nothing wrong with eating a mould. People have got used to thinking that fungi are something bad and disgusting. But scientist Alexander Fleming has proven that the fungi can be helpful and it emanates a substance with antibiotic properties. In the end, thanks to fungi, a lot of people have been cured and saved from death. The original uh, uh, look that Alexander Fleming had was to, um, the, the story is that he left the window open. He, he was a bit of a slob, to be honest, and he left all his um, petri dishes with um, bacteria growing on them, uh, on a bench, with an open window and the spores flowing from the fountain's pub, which is directly across the road, and maybe these penicillium, penicillium is the mould, and the spores landed on the petri dish. And his genius was that he, when he came back from holiday, he realised that um, the, the bacteria weren't growing around the penicillium mould. There was a little halo effect around that. And he realised there must be something in the mould that was preventing the bacteria growing, that was killing the bacteria. And um, it was mainly Howard Florey and, and others that actually ran with that and created the uh, penicillin as the first antibiotic. This was a major breakthrough, um, and since then lots of other antibiotics have actually been produced. Penicillin um, is the most famous antibiotic, one of the, probably the first actual antibiotic. There were antimicrobial compounds before then, but the first discovered and mass-produced antibiotic was penicillin. This comes from a fungus called penicillium. Penicillin is the actual compound antibiotic that the fungus, the mould, penicillium actually produces. Penicillium is a very common mould, one of the most common forms of mould. Um, in many cases, for people who work with these organisms, it's known as a weed because it turns up everywhere. If you're growing uh, moulds or indeed bacteria in a uh, microbiological laboratory, if you leave the window open and have poor technique, moulds, um, spores will come in and grow on those um, plates that you're, uh, agar plates that you're actually using. And one of the first fungi that will probably colonize is penicillium. It was, um, it was in the 1930s when, when this happened. And um, 
the uh, the first medius was um, during the war, and the the problem initially was producing enough of it. Um, it took um, uh, heroic amounts of of mold to actually to produce very very small amounts of of penicillin, and it wasn't until um, I think it was an American brewery actually converted all their tanks to to growing the mold that that we got um, enough penicillin to actually use therapeutically, and uh, it was immediately dispatched to Europe for the war effort, and a lot of people um, suffering from infections uh, um, were, were suddenly able to use the, the, this, this wonderful new drug. Penicillin is still used, but it's uh, the, the fourth and fifth generation derivatives of, of the original penicillin that are used now, and, and um, uh, other antibiotics that use a different mechanism to, to kill the bacteria. What penicillin does, it, it disrupts the, the bacterial um, capsule, the, the wall, uh, and beta-lactam sugars within that. It's um, uh, so, so that the, the, the bacteria explodes and it, it, it's, uh, it loses its um, uh, coating. How do moles fit into the great scheme of things? Well, they're just one aspect of life. As I've said, one wouldn't want to be without them because they do a grand job um, in decomposing materials, yeah? So yes, they fit into, into life in that if thing, when things die, when organic material dies, it needs to be re recycled. They have their bad aspects as well, um, as far as humans are concerned. Um, as I've hinted, some of them um, cause you disease, but also many of them might utilize materials that we don't want them to decompose. We call that deterioration rather than decomposition. Uh, but that's just in our minds. As far as the moulds are concerned, they're just eating that organic material. But some of the things that we don't want them to eat, well, you can think of lots of things that go mouldy. The wallpaper we've just been talking about, uh, sometimes your clothes go mouldy, don't they? Your food goes mouldy. Uh, camping equipment frequently goes mouldy because you don't dry out your tent and things like that. All of these things, uh, wood in window frames, uh, wooden window frames and house timber, that could go mouldy. Yeah, this is a deterioration rather than decomposition. But hey, it's all part of life, I suppose. This world is made perfect. Everything is brimful with the sense and there are no unnecessary components. Everything is connected with each other in a complicated but incredibly astonishing way, where each and every element is playing its special role.